everyone and thank you for tuning in for this New Age Engineering episode about PostgreSQL extensions. Uh, I'm Adam Furmanek, I'll be your host for today. And today with me we have two fantastic guests, Itai Brown, CTO of Metis, and Alvaro Hernandez, founder and CEO of Ongress. Thanks folks for joining. Uh, before we actually move on to the topic, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Itai, how about you? Sure. So uh, my name is Itai. I'm co-founder and CTO of Metis. I work with databases more than 20 years, uh, large banks, worked at Microsoft in the UK uh, as an advisor of some of the top customers, uh, moved back to Israel, opened a professional services company all around databases, and then a startup that extract data from database and put it in mobile. It was later acquired by ServiceNow. And now Metis, which we'll talk later, also helps developers to tackle database-related problems. Cool, sounds good. Alvaro, how about you? Well, thank you. You already introduced my uh, the headline of what I am. Uh, actually, a lot of people call me Alvaro. In Spanish, it's Alvaro. Both work for me. I've been basically working with Postgres for more than 20 years already. Postgres has been my database, go-to database for almost everything. Now I founded a company called Ongress. Ongress means on Postgres. So it's pretty obvious what we do, providing both professional services and products and services for Postgres. And I, well, obviously I love Postgres. I've also, uh, I'm a well-known member of the Postgres community. Uh, we actually, I founded a nonprofit organization in Spain to help Postgres develop in the world called Fundacion Postgres. And, uh, you know, uh, I've been doing databases, but Postgres has been the database that I started with and the database that I've always worked with because Postgres always fulfilled my needs, right? So the times I work with all the databases is either because I'm doing research, which I love doing, and I try to know all the spectrum of all potential possibilities around the world, but also, or because um, I'm helping some customer migrate to Postgres. Oh, sounds good. And as you can see, folks, pronouncing names is the hardest part in computer science. <laughs> cool, let us move on to the topic of our meeting today. So we can, we gathered just to discuss like extensions to Postgres, why they are successful, useful, helpful, and other stuff. So let's start with that. Why even talking about extensions? What's so good about them, folks? Uh, may, I, may I just start with a short story when I, uh, I, I don't do Postgres for 20 years, unfortunately, more like four. And w when I moved from MS SSQL to Postgres, I asked a friend of mine who did the process before, I said, what do I need to know? What are the big differences? And he said, extensions. That's the power of Postgres and the ability to extend functionality. But you have to understand that unlike other databases, when you just have the standard edition, enterprise edition, and this is it, you have hundreds, actually more than a thousand extensions. And as a developer or a DBA, part of your role is to know what to install, when to install, how to install. So it brings lots of, lots of power, but with great power comes with lots of responsibility and, and you need to know what to do about it. They said, this is a main, a huge change. I said, okay. Good, now I'm aware about it, and let's see what, what it means. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's been one of the most uh, loved features of Postgres considered across the, the, you know, the, all the history of Postgres. And, and this is not just factual, there's, there's data supporting this. I don't, actually, there's a, there's a great uh, yearly report that Timescale runs uh, and they ask many questions. What, by the way, 2023 edition is running right away, so you can go and fill it in. And extensions always come as one of the top three most loved features of Postgres. So what are essentially extensions and why are so loved and so important that can even change the decision to go with another database or not like you say detail, right? So extensions, the way you define them is kind of like plugins for your browser. You have a browser, Chrome or Firefox, whatever you prefer, and you know that you can install extensions, sorry, plugins on it, and they enhance the functionality in, in many potential different ways, right? From adding something to the context button on the mouse, to performing something on the background, to take a screenshot, whatever it is, right? So Postgres extensions are pretty much like this. It's a, it's a general framework, very loosely established. So you can do as basic things as adding one function, programming PLPG SQL, the stored procedure language for Postgres, 
suggested the new function, a new data type, to all the way down transforming Postgres into a distributed database, right? And everything in between. So extensions are what makes Postgres a database that is just not Postgres and that's it, end of the story, but rather Postgres with many other features, many other capabilities that you can pick and select and install into your database and use them at will. So it changes, it's a game changer and it makes Postgres behave in so many different ways with many of the different capabilities. Obviously you can develop your own extensions and it greatly enhances the, the flexibility and the, in general the extensibility of Postgres, which is also what defines Postgres database mainly. I and this say. is something unique to Postgres. What about other open source databases? Do they have something similar? There's nothing really like extensions. There's there's all the databases. For example, MySQL has pluggable storages. Right? Uh, with Postgres, you can create a, a pluggable storage as an extension also for the main part. Um, but but the way of distributing code as an extension, essentially what we need to think about an extension is that it prevents you, as long as your code, your variety that you're creating out of Postgres can fit within the extension framework. And by the way, framework is a loose term because it's not like a super well-defined framework. But if things can fit as an extension, you don't need to fork Postgres. So many other databases to add some kind of functionality, they need to fork the database to create a, a you know separate branch. Whereas with extensions, and you can fit within the extension idea and most use cases fit within the extension idea, then you're done. You don't need to fork anything. You don't need to create different variety. So give me some examples. Our listeners probably are interested. What can I do with those extensions? What are your best picks for the extending PostgreSQL? Um, so as you said, like all over the place. I mean, if, if you think of, uh, I don't know, monitoring, you can get deep insights to how the execution plan work and there's some statistics information and how the buffer cache works. On the other hand, if you are a developer and you need geographic information to create maps and routes, then there is an extension called PostGIS. By the way, some of them are commercial and managed by a company, some by the Marriott. Uh, therefore, time series, and, and uh, I think when we finish the, the session, and uh, I want to just share some uh, a list of um, more than a thousand extensions and the most popular ones. And I just named a few, and Alvaro, I'm, I'm sure you can just uh, add another 50. Definitely. Well, there is, there's a number one used extension, uh, which is uh, PTStat statements. Uh, which is a simple one, uh, but quite important, that helps you monitor query performance, right? Um, almost everybody uses PGStat statement, but by far not perfect at all, but, but it's, a, it's a good extension to get started. Uh, PostGIS, you mentioned it already, is critical for any, any GIS, turns Postgres into probably the most advanced GIS uh, relational database, right? So it's, it's, criti it's critical for that. As you mentioned, there's also extensions that are are the goal of some, some companies, like, like Timescale, for example, which turns Postgres into a time series database. There's, there's two versions of this extension, one Apache 2 and one Timescale license, which is a, a different license, commercial license, but um, it, it's transforming Postgres into an optimized time series database with a lot of really, really great features. Um, I mentioned before that an extension can turn Postgres into a distributed database. And one such example is Citus. Uh, an extension also, which actually has a very interesting story because it started as a fork of Postgres. So Citus, long time ago, it was a fork of Postgres. It was complicated to bundle everything into an extension, but then they figure out the way and they refactored Citus into an extension. And today it's an extension. The Citus got acquired by Microsoft and even improved further this extension and make everything that open source by them, not everything was by before that. And, and basically it can shard your database. So you can have a coordinator and multiple workers and your data will be split across all the workers and you can basically scale out Postgres. So this is another one that I love and, and I use extensively. There's other extensions that are quite important. Uh, there is uh, extensions for crypto, for you know uh, doing any cryptographic function like PG Crypto. A lot of people use it for encryption in the database, uh, a little bit manager yourself, but you know, and then there's kind of small, tiny extensions that are convenient all over the place. For example, there's extensions for UIDs, right? UID OSP. 
and and there is extensions for for many use cases like I, I don't know you mentioned itai there's approximately a thousand extensions there's no official repository or anything like that but uh, it's something we can talk along the way through this conversation but so we cannot give an exact number of how many extensions are but i guess 1k is is a good is so a good estimate i think maybe pg vector is a good example of the of extension okay just a reminder, maybe six months ago, we didn't even know what embedding in, in chat was, or only few know about it. Suddenly, everybody wants to use embedding in vector databases, and yes, there are databases dedicated for that, or you can use Postgres with a PG vector, and the fact that you can not only install it easily, but literally every month I read about, oh, we improved that, we have new enhancement, we have now better performances, we support this, we support that, and, and you can, the fast, the, 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 sorry, the rate of new features and new versions of the extension, that's a very, very powerful, and I think a great example of how Postgres can win using those extensions. The, yeah, in MySQL, there are some geographic data types, but you can't compare them to the breadth and depth of, and, and the rate of like uh, new versions of PostGIS being released with new features. So probably two good examples. Yeah, I, I think this is following the model of out-of-tree development, right? We can trace here a parallel with, for example, in Kubernetes, the CSI drivers, the, the container storage interface. At the beginning, most of them were in tree, meaning that they need to up get updated with the cadence of Kubernetes development. And they kind of need maintained or the expectations of those drivers were kind of leaning on the main Kubernetes development group instead of maybe the authors of those drivers, which sometimes are very cloud, you know, cloud vendor specific. Now they are most of them out of, or all of them out of tree and they are iterated differently. They're iterated at the vendor space and this provides much more flexibility and, and a different set of expectations, right? Um, and actually it's also important to consider, to understand what are the expectations. The uh, extensions may be developed under the, the same criteria in terms of security performance uh, than Postgres code base, less or more, right? So it's it's also important that there's, there's also a great variety there. But you mentioned a great extension now, it's super popular, PG Vector, because of this reason, and it's evolving very quickly. I don't know, we can bring many other examples. There is great extensions uh, for stabilizing query plans, for example. One, one, one issue that sometimes occurs in, in heavily OLTP databases is that you may experience a plan flip. Plan flip is a query that is running usually according to a given plan, which is good for you, always using some indexes, doing some basic joins, whatever, and it's responding within a few milliseconds. And then suddenly this query starts taking three seconds to respond. And, and obviously your database goes down, it's essentially. I mean, if this database is executed 50,000 uh, 50, times per second, right? And then what happened is that the statistics were a little bit off and Postgres flipped the plan to another one. But So there's an extension for this kind of use cases and others, which is called PG Hint Plan. And it's an extension that essentially allows you to set up some comments on the query and says, you are going to use this plan for this query, which might lead to suboptimal plans sometimes, but at least stable ones. So you avoid plan flips. There is a hyper PG for estimating indexes, right? So if you use this extension, you can see the impact of potentially creating an index without creating an index, because index creation is not cheap. It can involve a lot of IO, right? So you can do it concurrently with operations. It's not a blocking operation, but it may involve a lot of IO. You don't want to, and of course, uh, also uh, uh, hinders a right performance. So you cannot just create indexes because you want. So you can test them with hyper PG. There's extensions for security, things like PG Audit, for example. I also mentioned PG Crypto that also works in this space. PG Audit basically traces your logs and, and gives you hints of events that have, have happened on the database. Like there's almost in any space extensions for Postgres. I, mean, I think you also need to remember that you can write your own custom extensions if you want to deploy business logic. Again, that on top of what the market release is kind of like, if you want to do some operation close to the database, you can run select statement. And I don't know, you have, for example, a very complicated JSON with some proprietary schema and you want to extend it and, and run queries on top of that. 
you can wrap all of this logic as an extension and deploy it on your Postgres. So that's another very powerful tool. As a system architect, you need to consider that as well. Actually, let me make a comment here. There was um, extensions, again, they're very generic thing. They can mean many things. There's ways of adding things to Postgres, but you can add these things in many different ways. Two main categories of extensions are those that are compiled, that essentially are written typically in C code, uh, and they, they hook into Postgres uh, extension points called hooks, and they replace some internal code of Postgres with the extensions code. These extensions need to be compiled, be deployed in a specific way, and they're actually loading, loading code into your database. Um, those are harder, let's say, to deploy, more careful to manage, can affect stability of the database potentially. You need to think more carefully about them. But there is another category of extensions, which are your SQL. Anything that you can write in SQL or PLPG SQL or any procedural language you're using in Postgres can be also packaged an extension. So these extensions or uh, some lighter extensions can be thought of as a convenient way to distribute code, to distribute your DDL. And there was a few years ago uh, some some code that we wrote to essentially help package your DDL as extensions and deploy exclusively as extensions. Because then it's exactly what you said, Itai, everything is packaged and then uh, under a single unit, which is actually version. And then you can say, oh, you know, uh, I split my DDL into these three modules. Uh, there's a common set of functions that I use for all the company's projects. You can have a base layer, we call this common, and then there is this for this functionality, this for this functionality, and all of them are deployed as three extensions on my Postgres database. And I create extension, create extension A, create extension B, create extension C, C, and I'm done. I, I've got all my DDL on my database. And this is also a very convenient way just to pack your applications. That's simple. This is also an extension. And speaking from the user perspective, how do I use the extensions? What do I need to do to install them? Which platforms do I need to use? What providers maybe? Um, okay. It really depends on the provider. Kind of like, say if you want to start from scratch, you open your, you go to Docker Hub, you download the, an empty PG-15, then there is a manual process of the create extension, and sometimes you need to bring the code because it doesn't even have the code on that uh, Docker image. Uh, so that's kind of like the, the naive, simple answer if you want to use Docker. Most of the audience, I think, would use platforms such as uh, OnGress, such as AWS, RDS, Superbase, where part of the power they give the users is the ability to more easily create those extensions. So this is kind of like one question, how easily can you do that? When it comes to uh, Stackware, just like one tick of a box, and, and I'm sure Alvaro can, can ex explain more. Something very, very important to understand that if you work with a PG as a service, one of these managed services, you have to be aware what extensions they offer and what extensions they don't. We in Medis encounter a problem and AWS do not support the extension we needed. This is it. End of story. You can't argue, you can't apply, you can't do anything about it. When it comes to the guy, the great support at Stackers, we opened the ticket, we spoke with them. A week later, we had this another extension. I think I value there was like 200 extensions already or something like that. And, and, and if needed, yes. you can add more. Yeah. So with Superbase, there are a short list of extensions, but with a single click, you can add them. So it really, really varies to from one platform to another. Yeah, you, you put it very well. Um, let me just formalize from a more technical perspective. There is essentially three potential steps that you need to execute to create, uh, run an extension, drive an extension to Postgres. The first two being a little bit optional. The first one is bringing the extension code to the file system. Uh, so the extension is, is some, some files, right? Depending on its nature, it's going to be different, but it's going to be some files that needs to be present in the, in the file system, which the database can access, has access to, right? And how you bring the, these files to that file system, what you said, it depends on the provider. If you're running Postgres yourself, it's on you. 
for example, if you're using a Docker container, you're probably need, gonna need to build a custom Docker image based maybe on the official Postgres image, then you need to compile the extension and add your own code. It's not super complicated, but obviously this is a little bit of friction. If you're installing Postgres like with apt-get, you know, with Debian or RPM packages, some extensions are packaged, some are not. There is a mechanism for called pgxn where you can, where it pulls the source code of the extension and compiles it on your system as long as you have all the dependencies that the extension needs, which is also on you. Uh, so basically you can download an extension, compile it, it will break and you'll figure out how to fix it, right? It's a little bit also involved. If you're running on a managed services provider, then the extensions are already there for you. You don't need to do anything, but some extensions, as you said, it's a, many extensions are not available. We can discuss also about the numbers. I can give you some numbers. Um, so this is the first part, bringing the extension to the file system. The second part is that some extensions need to be added to some configuration parameters. Some extensions need to be preloaded by Postgres into shared memory area. And you need to tune a parameter called shared preload libraries. So many extensions that do, especially the big, let's call it the big extensions, they need to be loaded via this mechanism. And changing this parameter requires a restart of your database. So you're gonna need to bring it down, bring it up, back. Uh, it will take a few seconds of downtime for your database. So it's something that for, for you know production database, you need to handle with care. Maybe you also need to tweak all the configuration parameters about the extension, also adding them to postgresql.com, but probably these parameters may not be restart or you'll be, do it all at once. Once these two steps are completed, Again, the, the first one depends on the provider. The second one depends on the extension. Sometimes you need this, sometimes you don't. Then the user experience from this point is very simple. You just connect to the database that you want to create the extension on. Some extensions are database dependent. Some extensions are kind of global, so you can pick any database. And then just do create extension and then the name of the extension. And that's it. Finally, now your extension is available. If you use something like psql, you can list the extensions with a backslash dx. Um, and you can also list the available extensions in the file system calling a function called pg um, available extensions, pg underscore available underscore. And what uh, about extension. updating the extensions? So there's, there's also command to update the extension, but again, first you need to make sure that they're present in the file system. Uh, maybe you also need to update the parameters about the extensions, also depend on your use case. And finally, you'll you'll update the, the extension also with our, with our command line. There is, um, all the extensions come with some SQL control files that they provide the uh, update path from version to version. Okay, is there any like CI CD for those extensions so I can get them updated automatically? Probably not. <laughs> and, 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 and it's an, it's an important effort. For example, the, the main problem may happen when you do a PG upgrade. Like if you're upgrading the Postgres mayor version, one thing you need to make sure is that all the extensions that you're running today will be available in the next mayor version you're upgrading to and they work the same way. And this is not always the case. So, well, any mayor version upgrade is an is a operation that you need to take it careful, carefully and requires testing. And, but this should involve absolutely your extensions. There is a project I mentioned just before PGXN, this project that will fetch the source code of extensions from a repository and try to compile on your local environment. There is a project from the same project called PGX, Docker PGXN or PGXN Docker that essentially is helping uh, setting up what you're saying, like a CI CD where you will start with a base image of a Postgres and add some extension and run this uh, on, a, on a CI CD fashion. But it will also require, if the extension has dependencies, it will also require effort on your side to improve this and to, to get the extensions to compile first place. Only a few days ago, I needed to run some Docker container with a PG cron, and it's not part of the base in the Docker image. And, and a few good people say like, this is like the, the, the minimum Postgres and something called Postgres base with some pre-packaged uh, extension that you probably might need and even if you don't they can stay there that's fine but uh, we have to always remember the core team of Postgres responsible for maintaining the engine and the owner of each extension needs to maintain it so what when I look on an extension before deciding whether or not I want to start using it 
I see how many stars it has, who's the owner, how often they, they uh, um, update it, how quickly they respond to change requests. That's a very important part of your consideration. And again, when you switch to PG15, you have to make sure everything works. Cool. So you mentioned that not all platforms support all ext extensions, right? What is the reason? What is the risk of bringing more extensions to the system? Well, I would say there's there's two main considerations, right? As, as a provider, you need to make. First one is security. Um, if the extensions is just you know SQL code, there's there's nothing risky there other than the quality of the code. But if the extension is an extension written in C that replaces some function pointers within the Postgres source code to provide additional behavior uh, and gets loaded into the memory space of Postgres itself, it's something that can literally bring down your database, can literally corrupt your data and cause major harm to Postgres itself, right? So a misbehaving extension can do that. So th that's a potential security risk. When you're loading an extension, you should know what you're doing and the extension should be assessed from a security perspective. Security and, and also stability, right? So that's one. The other one is long-term that I think, uh, or I know that uh, most cloud providers take uh, into significant consideration, which is the long-term stability of the extension. I know in detail, for example, Amazon AWS has a very, very deep uh, sense of customer responsibility in terms of maintaining services that are created. So Amazon's philosophy is that once you publish a service, basically they will try not to deprecate it, they deprecate it right? or at least maintain like for a decade. The same happens with extensions. Once they provide an extension, there might be a customer using it. And nine years down the road, this customer will say, ah, I want to upgrade this extension to this given version. So there's also a point of who is maintaining the extensions and you know, as a vendor, you need to make sure that what happens if this provider stops developing the extension, yet my customers still want to use it. Am I able to support this or not? So I think those two factors are the main decision drivers, especially for cloud managed services, whether to add an extension or not. The risks of, you know, blowing your database. And it's not that this happens frequently, by the way. It sounds maybe that some of the audience may be like scared, like, okay, I will never use a Postgres extension. Not at all. Actually, I've never seen this case. It's, it's kind of a theoretical exercise, but it's a theoretical exercise that needs to be done, right? And, and, and the other one is the long-term maintainability of extensions. Cool. So in case of Ongress, so Alvaro, you said that you have, what, 200 extensions in your platform. How do you deal with this long-term stability, as you called it? So Stackrest, let, let me make a, a, a very quick introduction. It's a platform for running Postgres on Kubernetes, right? It's, a, it's kind of a GitLab for Postgres, meaning that you have everything that you need for Postgres. It comes with connection pooling, high availability, monitoring, uh, logs, management, uh, graphical interface, everything that you need to, for, for Postgres operation. And obviously extensions are a great and most important part of what we do. But Stackrest is not a managed service. So we don't have the same, uh, you know, criteria in into putting into this as a cloud service because we are not providing the, the service. This is something you run on any Kubernetes cluster. It could be on the cloud, could be on-prem. It's up to you how you run your Kubernetes cluster. We just provide you the means for running automated Postgres on top of it with a kind of a production uh, uh, production quality, right? So the extensions that we provide, uh, we need to rely on the upstream vendors. If they stop maintaining an extension, we will also stop maintaining that extension. But we don't, we, we're not servicing this promise of a service. So, I mean, we will be sorry about that seeing happening, but we cannot control that fate. No, nor we have the hands anyway to do this, right? We're not AWS yet. So uh, we, we just uh, select the extensions, not taking into account this criteria. Uh, we, we actually, as you said, we are very close to supporting 200 extensions. And I think it's also interesting to, to, to give numbers here. So there is approximately 1,000 extensions out there for Postgres, as I mentioned before, right? Take it or leave it, this is the order of magnitude. Now, out of those, out of that 1,000 extensions, there is around 50 or 60 that are called country. 
that essentially come with the Postgres package. So almost everybody supports these 50 or 60 extensions. It, it's, it's just, they're just there. They're not supposed to have the same quality as the Postgres package itself, but they come with Postgres. So mostly everybody supports this 50 or 60. So the question is how many of the rest of the extensions are supported? This, I call it third party extensions. So if you look at the AWS with RDS and Aurora, which is the cloud provider that as far as I know supports the, large, the highest number of extensions, it supports between 80 and 90, which means essentially 20, 30, uh, mostly third, third party extensions, no more than that. The others are called core contract, they're called core, core contract. Not all of them are supported by RDS neither. So there's like around 40 third party extension support. If you look at Cloud SQL and Azure, they are around 60 to 70. So less, not much less, but less. Um, I don't have numbers for all the providers right now, but they're all in this same area, around 60 to 80 extensions supported, most of which are contrib anyway, which are, you know, well, almost everybody else supports. In Stackgres, we developed some specific software for being able to dynamically load extensions into Postgres. So we don't need to build container images with them. We can just load them directly. Uh, we created a repository of extensions and we're close to supporting 200. And this number is just where we are today. It will be 300 next year or 400. We will see, but uh, we are trying to constantly add new extensions there. And uh, we, again, we don't need to care about those long-term maintainability because it's just our choice to provide whatever the market provides and the user who's going to run the service, it will, it will be the one who makes the decision on whether to add a given extension or not. Cool. Itai, how do you use extensions in Metis then? We know those extensions are great. You mentioned some of the names. Now, what about the actual use cases? What do you achieve with your service and extensions? Well, uh, like two totally different uh, questions. First, uh, which extension do we use internally? And what is a platform that want to protect the, the developers can say about extensions? So, we use a few extensions internally. Again, everything related to monitoring the PG star statement and PG buffer package, everything that can help you to know what went wrong. And kind of like bear in mind that because databases are complicated and because sometimes it's hard, even for companies with good QA to track all changes, at some point, sooner or later, the production database is on fire and you need to know why. And you need to know which questions to ask. So if at this point, only then you start asking yourself, hmm, which extension should I use? How am I going to use it? That, that's way too late. So you need all of those extensions in advance. And also bear in mind, some of the extension collect data. So you want this data to be collected so you can see some, some changes. And this very same functionality is that we ask and provide, we, we use it internally. So again, PG start statement, PG buffer, we're playing with hypo PG, to, uh, hypothetical indexes. Um, a great example is the PG plan store that help us looking into the execution plan so you can finally understand what exactly is happening. As all the developers remember, SQL is declarative. It just said, Select stuff from this table, here are the logical conditions. Yeah, but how exactly the engine processes the information? Maybe it doesn't use any index for whatever reason. And only the execution plan can give you this information. So we have a curated list of extensions that we recommend using. We raise alerts to all of our customers if they are not using those extensions. And once they start using those extensions, we bring insights, not just like here is the raw data select star, because everybody can do that just reading the documentation. We kind of like help, helping you to understand what exactly is the information you see and alerts to proactively warn you before your database, production database, start encountering all of those problems. Okay, cool. So if we were to leave our audience with some specific call to action, what extensions would you recommend to install in the very first place? Why was the rationale? I would say PC plan, uh, sorry, PG start statement, no brainer, because that shows what's going on in the, um, the history of the 
table activity, database activity, PG uh, buffer cache because if something is going is wrong with the memory, I think you should have PG cron underhand because I can't imagine a production database without some kind of recurring jobs to monitor, to delete all data, to proactively search for, for problems. Some of them are done externally, but sometimes you want to do it uh, internally. If you can, PG plan store will also show you the execution plan. Uh, Hypo PG is also recommended just to avoid actually building the index. As Avaro said, it might be very time consuming, but you can just said, assume this index exists would you use it in that particular query? So on top of my head, these are the top extensions. If I'll think of uh, another one, I'll, I'll write it down in, uh, in the blog post. Alvaro, anything you wanna um, add on top of that? Yeah, I, I fully agree with all the ones that you, you mentioned. Um, then depending on your use case, obviously there's gonna be all the extensions you're gonna be using. As a general one, I could maybe think of also PGStat Kcache that also helps you get, gather metrics from the IO subsystem, right? Um, maybe PG Hint Plan can also be interesting to prevent these plan flips, as I mentioned before. But then it really depends on your use case. There's there's one that I'm using a lot, uh, which is called Post, it comes with Postgres, also called, called Postgres FDW. It's a foreign data wrapper. The foreign data wrapper is the mechanism that Postgres has to access data over the network from other sources. And this particular one allows you to access data from another Postgres. And this can be used for many purposes, including even, for example, for, for transparently sharding Postgres across all the nodes to access data from another node. Um, there, is, there is a particular extension that I think it's worth mentioning, not necessarily because you need it to have installed today, but it doesn't harm either, which is called PGTLE. And, and TLE uh, means the Trust uh, Language Execution Environment. And it's, um, it's a mean of running extensions in a safer manner than what we've been discussing here. It's essentially kind of a, a way of loading extensions without having to explicitly touch the file system. So you can load functions over the call to the function to PGTLE itself. And this allows to load more extensions in a safe way into Postgres. So this maybe is also not a bad one to have, uh, but really it, it really depends on your use case. If you're going to do some sharding, you may load Citus, right? If you want to do time series, you may want to load timescale. Uh, if you want to use uh, text search, you may want to use a TGRM, TreeGram extension. If you want to use additional data types for, for some 3D uh, functions, you may use a load cube extension. Like there's so many extensions um, that, that you can go and look into them. Okay, so that creates a great list that we'll share with the audience in the description. Let's now switch gears, folks, and land this episode. Uh, Itai, where are you now? I live in Haifa, the north of Israel. Cool, and what food place would you recommend over there for the people around the area? When, when people come to Haifa, they usually want to see the Baha'i Shrine, which is like a World Heritage place. Uh, unfortunately, all around it are tourist traps, so you don't want to eat there. You want to walk a little bit toward the sea and go to the Lux restaurant of Chef Ala Musa, modern Israeli Arabic food, really, really high quality. Cool. Alvaro, how about you? Well, uh, you're asking me where I am now. Now I am in Madrid, but just for a few hours. <laughs> After that, I'll be flying to Sao Paulo in Brazil. But okay, I guess I can answer the question as of literally now in Madrid. And in Madrid, there's there's a, obviously a huge community from, from Latin America, from all our broader countries. And one of my favorite foods from, from Latin America is Peruvian food. It's really, really rich, very, um, very great mixture of uh, Asian, actually, and Latin American food. So Peruvian food is among the, the best foods I've ever tasted. And there's a really, really great Peruvian restaurants in Madrid. One that comes to mind is probably my favorite one. It's called Pai Pai in, in Plaza del Peru. So actually very appropriate. 
And this is a, a delicious, delicious fusion food that you can have there. I absolutely recommend cool. it. Thank you for these recommendations and let's call it a day then. So thank you for attending this episode about extensions to PostgreSQL. For our audience, if they wanted to reach out to you, what would be the best way, Itai, to ask you additional questions? Go to our website, metisdata.io. There's at the top corner, you'll see our, uh, a link to our Discord channel and we can take a conversation from there. Cool. Alvaro, how people can reach you? Well, probably the best way is to uh, find me on Twitter. Um, I will not pronounce my Twitter handle because it's not easy to pronounce in English, but I guess we can uh, add it to the show notes. But find me on Twitter. I also run my personal website on aht.es, alphahoteltango.es, easy to locate. And there is uh, all the information, contact information about me, but also all the talks I have done. They're recorded there, slides. There's more than 120 talks as of now. So there's a lot of material there. And there's contact, contact information about me. And there's obviously my company, uh, Twitter, Ongress Inc. and website ongress.com. Easy to find me anyway. Um, just a Google cool. search. Thank you for that. So if you do have any questions, feel free to ask them directly. And being that said, we would like to mention that soon you will be able to run a Metis with Stackgress. So we are working hard on our integration. So stay tuned for our official announcement when it's ready. And being that said, thank you for tuning in and see you next time in the next episode. Follow us on social media. Look me up on Twitter at Metis Data. And stay safe. See you next time. Cheers. Cheers. Always a pleasure. Have a great flight. Thank Bye. you.